So I'm going to get started. Um, our announcements for today are that the Chapter 8 sapling is due 9 a.m. Monday. The exam review is going to be this weekend, 3 to 5 p.m. Sunday. Duane, you want to be 20, same as usual, lecture captured. Um, and then the exam is going to be Tuesday night, 7 to 9 p.m. in Chem 140. Um, so I'm still not sure how far we're going to get through Chapter 9. I'll draw the cutoff at the end of lecture on Monday. Um, but tentatively expect that we're going to get up through... maybe like the end of page seven in the notes. Um, if we make it less far or farther than that, then we can update that accordingly. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, cool. So, um, so last lecture we mostly got into sort of a roadmap of how this chapter is gonna go. We looked at the basic idea for substitution and for elimination, and then we looked at how the kinetics for our reactions can change. So we wrapped up with looking at four different reactions we're going to see in this chapter, SN2, E2, SN1, and E1. So substitution, second order, elimination, second order, and so on. Okay, so the next few pages of the notes are just going to be going through these reactions in order and looking at the details for each of them. So first up is SN2. This is going to be the longest section because we see a lot of things for the first time here. And then in subsequent ones, we can just say this is the same as it is for SN2. Okay. So this is a bimolecular substitution. Okay. So the mechanism here, um, we're going to look at first. And then we're going to dig into how every little attribute of this mechanism affects something about the reaction. Okay, so the general idea is you have some kind of nucleophile, usually with a minus charge. You have some kind of carbon with a halogen on it, because this is a chapter all about alkyl halides. Um, so what's going to happen is this nucleophile comes in and attacks the carbon at the same moment that the halogen is leaving. So um, we don't normally show transition states as part of the mechanism, but if you want to, you can do it for this reaction because it does turn out looking at the transition state is kind of helpful here. Um, so if you remember to show a transition state, you want to show partial bonds for anything that's breaking or forming during the reaction. So we've got a partial and U to C bond at the midpoint of this step, and a partial C to X bond going on here. All right, so <clears throat> charge-wise, nucleophile is somewhere between zero and negative one charge, so we're gonna do delta negative there. <clears throat> and the X is somewhere between neutral and the negative charge it's about to get, so we're gonna do delta negative there too. Um, just realizing the charges that I drew in the transition state didn't print. Whoops. Um, so I'll try to fix that in the notes for next year. But um, you've got delta negatives on both of those. OK, so that's our transition state. So where we go to after this is we just, in one step, go to nucleophile is now bonded to whatever carbon we had. and our halogen has gotten kicked out as a leaving group. Okay, so this right here is enough to explain why the reaction is second order. There's only a single step, and it involves the nucleophile and the alkyl halide together. So they're both involved in the rate determining step. So it's bimolecular. Okay. 
All right, so any questions about that before we start digging into this some more? Okay, cool. So what we're going to do now is sort of run through the three different sections of the molecules involved here. So we're going to dig into how the nucleophile affects how well the reaction works. Then we're going to look at how well the R group, which is that R attached to our X in the alkyl halide, how the structure of that affects the reaction. And then we're going to look at the F, how that affects the reaction. And then we're going to look a little bit more at stuff like geometry, too. Okay. Um, actually, let's do that out of order, just because that's how I have the notes. All right, so R group versus rate. Okay, so everything here kind of comes down to <coughs> at the transition state, at the highest energy point of the reaction, carbon's trying to hold on to five things at once, whether they're with full bonds, like to the what I've shown as H's here, or whether they're partial bonds. So at the transition state, C has five bonds or partial bonds. In other words, we could describe it as temporarily pentavalent. Okay, so um, turns out that space is kind of at a premium here. We are trying to pack in a lot of stuff around that tiny carbon atom. And the bigger that stuff is, the harder that's going to be. So sterics, having big bulky groups attached to that carbon, are going to make this really difficult. Okay. So here's some examples of substrates. In other words, some examples of Rx molecules. And here's some relative rates. All right, so you got methyl bromide, ethyl bromide, isopropyl bromide. Uh, yeah, I got room here. All right. All right, sorry if that overlaps the hazy area at the bottom of the screen, or at the bottom of the board, but that's a terp butyl bromide. Okay, so in other words, to label the carbons we've got attached to our alkyl halides here, this is a primary carbon for ethyl bromide. Um, this is secondary. This is tertiary <laughs> carbon. So this carbon has three bonds to other Cs, two bonds to other Cs, one bond to other Cs. We haven't actually looked at a label for what to call this one that has zero bonds to other Cs. Um, we don't call it zero degrees. We call it methyl, which makes sense because it's a methyl group attached to the bromine. Okay, so four different degrees of substitution, either zero, one, two, or three bonds to other carbons. If we sort of arbitrarily set the rate of ethyl bromide as being one under some particular conditions, I think it's like room temperature at some standard concentration, um, then the rates for the others are 145 for methyl bromide, so way faster than ethyl bromide. Um, for isopropyl here, it's 0.0. .0 Zero seven eight, so much slower. And for terp butyl bromide, it's zero point zero 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 five. So just by tweaking how much other stuff is on that carbon, um, and how difficult it is to pack everything in when you're trying to go pentavalent, we can massively tweak how easy this step of the reaction is. So this is why I actually chose to th throw three H's on there for the first example. That's kind of the best case scenario, is just having three H's to deal with. The more you swap those out for other carbons or other R groups, the harder and harder this gets. Okay. So we would actually call these like, these are good, decent reactions that you would get to work properly in a lab. Um, this is kind of mediocre. Like, it'll go, but you'll be waiting a long time. 
And if there's other reactions that can happen, they might outcompete it. We'll look at that later. Um, and then this one, terbutyl bromide, we would consider no reaction. Or, for short, NR. <clears throat> it's just too slow to be viable. Okay, so questions about those. Okay, so this is looking at increasing degrees of substitution on the alpha carbon. Remember, the alpha carbon is the one where the actual halogen attaches directly onto the molecule. So we're having more and more R groups on that alpha carbon. What if we tweak the beta carbon instead? So increasing substitution at the beta carbon. Let's look at a few different options there. OK. <clears throat> so again, let's do ethyl bromide, propyl bromide. This one, which is isobutyl bromide, and then this one. All right, so again, if we go out to the beta carbon, we can look at, like, excluding the alpha carbon itself, like how much other stuff is attached on there. Um, actually, not excluding the alpha carbon, just overall. So here we've got a primary beta carbon, secondary beta carbon, tertiary beta carbon, and quaternary beta carbon. OK, so again, we're sort of arbitrarily setting the rate for ethyl bromide at some set of conditions as one. For the rest of them in the series, it's 0 0.82, 0 0.036, and 0 0.000012. <laughs> OK, so these three would consider OK. Um, this one would also consider no reaction. It's just too slow to be useful. OK. <clears throat> so a um, few words about this. Um, one is that if you've got a tertiary alkyl halide, that means that SN2 is ruled out right off the bat. No SN2 on tertiary alkyl halides, and also no SN2 on alkyl halides where the beta carbon is quaternary. Okay, so this last one is what's called the neopental effect. Um, for some reason that I don't know, um, this particular molecule here, pull this down a little bit, is called, well, let me draw it up here. Um, this molecule from up here is neopental bromide. So it turns out neopental bromide doesn't undergo SM2 at all. Um, even though the carbon itself, where the reaction is taking place, might be primary. Um, so that part looks fine. Um, it turns out that even if it doesn't have many R groups on this carbon, if those R groups coming off of it, like this terbutyl group is coming off of the central carbon, that right there is enough to sort of throw a wrench in the works and stop SN2 from happening either. OK. Um, so questions about any of that? Cool. All right, so that's pretty much all we need to know for the R group versus rate for this reaction. Um, let's look at the X group versus rate. OK. So we know there's only one step in this reaction. It's 
the only, it's the rate determining step. It pretty much has to be. Um, and during that step, the carbon halogen bond is breaking. So we know that for this reaction to work, we're going to have to break that carbon halogen bond. Um, and the easier it breaks, the faster that step is going to go. So <coughs> weaker bond is faster to break, which means faster reaction. Okay, so the strength of the carbon halogen bond partially depends on um, how stable the leaving group is with a negative charge. <laughs> so it's largely set by the stability of the halide leaving group. Which, it turns out, we already have a whole table about how stable things are likely to be with a negative charge. Um, it's actually exactly the same information as pKa values. We know that the more stable something is with a negative charge, the more likely it is to take on that negative charge, which means that if it had an H on there to start out with hypothetically, it would give up that H more willingly and be a stronger acid and have a lower pKa value. So more stable with negative charge basically works out to lower pKa value of conjugate acid, um, which means that if we look at our pKa tables, leaving group ability basically works out to RF kind of sucks. RCL is quite a bit better, RBR is better still, and RI is the best. So iodine is the best leaving group because it's the most stable with a negative charge, which we know because HI is the strongest acid out of all of those. Okay. So any questions about that? Okay. Cool. Um, all right, so that's the halogen. That's pretty short and easy. Not a whole lot of variability there. We only have four halogens to pick from, assuming we ignore the radioactive ones. Um, okay. So how about the nucleophile? Okay, so I mentioned last lecture that there's this whole question of how good a nucleophile is versus how good a base it is. Um, so something can be really good in both categories or good in one and bad at the other. Um, so just to sort of sum up here, nucleophilicity is how good something is at forming a bond to anything other than a proton. For the purposes of these reactions that we're looking at in this chapter, that basically means carbon. <coughs> Meanwhile, basicity is how good it is at forming a bond to H. Okay, so we know there's sort of two options for this molecule that's coming in, the nucleophile. Um, it could rip off an H hypothetically, which would make it a base, which would mean that we have to do an elimination. Or it could go onto the carbon directly, which means the halogen has to leave, which means we're doing substitution. So kind of two different options. And how well it scores in each of these categories is going to sort of tip the balance one way or the other a lot of the time. Okay. So we already have good numbers on how to evaluate basicity. Again, pKa tables will tell us how strong a base something is. 
So basicity uh, is basically from PKA tables. But how do we evaluate nucleophilicity? <coughs> because unlike basicity, there's pretty much only one type of proton. Um, so we can get just a single number for how good a base something is. Nucleophilicity, there's a ton of different circumstances that carbon could be in. So we pretty much just want to pick like the best case scenario for doing SN2. Um, and then just like look at how good different things are at going after that carbon. So we're going to use the best Rx possible, and we're going to measure the rates. Okay, so based on what I've covered up here, what is the best possible alkyl halide I could use for SN2? So what R groups is it going to have? Methyl, right? And what halogens is it going to have? Iodide, yep. So that's exactly what we're going to use to measure how good our nucleophiles are. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to put up a couple different tables here again. Um, rates for SN2 on methyl iodide. Um, interestingly though, so our alkyl halide is pretty much like nailed down um, if we want this reaction to go as fast as possible. Um, it turns out playing around with the solvent here will actually do some really weird stuff to the rate of this reaction. So I'm going to put up a couple different, value, a couple different tables here. Um, one is nucleophile within same row of the periodic table. OK, so so again, I'm sort of using the phrase base nucleophile to describe a molecule that could theoretically do either of those jobs. For SN2, we know it's doing the nucleophile job, but in other circumstances, things might be otherwise. OK, we're going to put up its pKa value, which we already know from near the start of the semester. And then its SN2 rates in CH3OH as the solvent. OK, so here we go. CH3O minus, so methoxide. Phenyl O minus, so phenoxide. ACO minus is acetate. And then F minus is fluoride. So note that three of these actually have the same nucleophilic atom even. Um, but because of the other stuff attached to them, their pKa values are going to vary quite a bit. So 15.1, 10, 4.76, and 3.2. <clears throat> okay, so the SN2 rates in methanol is the solvent. Um, we're going to arbitrarily set fluoride as rate of 1, um, which means that acetate gives a rate of 54. Uh, phenoxide gives 1580. And methoxide gives 5000. OK, so quite a big change here for something that's going up by 10 pKa units. OK, so that's one set of data that we have. We can talk about what this means and the trends it implies in just a second here. But let me just put up the other table real quick, um, which is within the same column of the table. So 
base nucleophile, pKa rates in CH3OH. And we're also here going to look at rates in DMF. OK, so quick reminder here from chapter 8. CH3OH is, is that protic or aprotic? Protic, right? Yep. Uh, <coughs> arrow here. So that's protic. DMF, is that protic or aprotic? Aprotic, yeah. If it goes by an acronym, it's almost certainly aprotic. OK. Just because we tend to use acronyms to describe larger organic structures, which generally don't have protic groups on them, um, just by convention. OK. All right, so we're looking for a column in the periodic table. Halogens are really convenient here. Iodine, or iodide rather, bromide, chloride, fluoride. OK, um, pKa values may vary a little bit depending on which reference you're using, but I think Loudon sticks with minus 10, minus 8, minus 6, and 3.2. OK, so again, we're setting fluoride um, on, in methanol as a default value of 1. And so as we go up the table from there, we get 60, 1,600, and 68,000. Um, meanwhile, in DMF, we get 8 million. <laughs> uh, 15.4 million, 29.6 million, and at least 35 million, but it's too fast to measure for sure. Sorry, that's a greater than. OK. So what did we learn from doing these reactions in our hypothetical lab and getting these numbers? Um, OK, so trends here. Um, in protic solvents, like CH3OH, Within the same row of the periodic table, um, more basic means more nucleophilic. Um, however, within the same column, more basic, so fluorine or fluoride is more basic, but it's actually less nucleophilic. It's slower at doing this reaction. And then um, I didn't include the numbers for DMF here, but I probably should just put them um, but in aprotic solvents, like DMF, more basic turns out to always mean more nucleophilic. always means more nucleophilic, and also the reaction is way, way faster. Mm. 
Okay. So, how do we explain these trends? Like, why does protic solvent flip what it's doing depending on whether we're going sideways or down in the periodic table? Um, so, the analogy that the textbook uses that I kind of like is like um, the solvent molecules just sort of get in the way and get tangled up with the nucleophile um, because they're so busy H bonding to the nucleophile that they sort of provide like steric hindrance. So, solvent caging is going to around smaller nucleophiles, especially. And makes it hard to get to the Rx. Okay. So, for example, if you've got F minus here, it's going to get slowed down in protic solvent because it's busily H bonding to all the other molecules around it. And it's sort of dragging these around and when it tries to get close to the alkyl halide is going to have a much harder time getting in there. So like that. Okay. So as soon as we swap fluoride to being in an aprotic <coughs> solvent like DMF we take away this hindrance factor and suddenly this thing is raring to go and can easily go after and attack the alkyl halide. Okay, so for practical purposes, if you're setting up an SN2, um, aprotic is the best way to do it. It's going to be fastest. But sometimes for practical reasons, you just end up using aprotic because it's cheaper and still works okay for what you're doing. Okay. Um, any other questions about that part? Okay, cool. So um, that's sort of the three components of the molecules that we're looking at. Let's spend a little bit of time looking at stereochemistry. Because this, it turns out, is also completely dictated by the way the mechanism works. Um, so you may have noticed when I drew the mechanism up here, I have the nucleophile coming in from the exact opposite direction that the halogen leaves. Um, that's not an accident. So nucleophile always attacks from the opposite direction that the leaving group is pointing. So this is called backside attack. Okay. Um, so in practical terms, what this looks like is if you have an asymmetric carbon that's attached to your halogen, say something like this. And because I want to keep SN2 working pretty fast here, I'm going to sort of cheat a little and stick a deuterium on there so that this is still an asymmetric carbon, but the sterics are decent enough that SN2 is still working okay. Um, all right, so say we attack it with ethoxide, ETO minus. It's going to swing in, attack on here. Here. So you'll notice that I've showed the iodide sticking straight out that way, and the other three groups are kind of sticking back towards me, kind of like an umbrella. The visual metaphor that they used to describe this is picture the other three groups on the carbon being like an umbrella turning inside out. So after the reaction happens, I now have ethoxide stuck on the carbon, and the other three groups have sort of turned inside out, so now the umbrella is pointing towards me over here on the right. 
So like that's CH3. Okay, so the practical effect of this is that so long as your leaving group was highest priority over here and your nucleophile is highest priority over here out of all the four things on here, doing SN2 will convert it from R to S or vice versa. So if both the nucleophile and the leaving group are highest priority, okay. Um, so I'll draw a few more examples down here of how this might look. So say we have this molecule with a bold iodine on it. If we do SN2, um, then we're going to end up with a dashed whatever the nucleophile is instead. So bold iodide in this case converts to dashed bromine. Um, so basically, if you keep the molecule drawn all the same, SN2 is just going to convert bold to dashed or dashed to bold. Um, another example is... Say we have a bold methyl and a dashed bromine, and we hit it with NaOAC. We're going to convert to something with a bold methyl and a bold OAC. Okay, so note that the methyl group here is actually staying the same the whole time. Oh. <laughs> um, but the bromine is still flipping dash to bold. All right, so any questions about what's happening here? Other than why, which I will get to in just a second, using the water that is remaining in my bucket. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm going to clean off that side of the board real quick. The reason this happens the way it does actually comes back to MO theory. <laughs> um, so looking at the shape of the orbitals in both um, kind of explains how this works. Um, you may remember that, so if we're doing a CBR bond here, the shape of the sigma bond is going to sort of involve overlap. Um, of these two lobes. So basically, like, we've got um, sort of a shared overlapping um, head-on overlap to make a sigma bond between these two atoms. Um, it turns out if you do destructive interference between the atoms, 
you end up with an extra node in the middle. So you've got a little lobe in the middle there, and then a big lobe sticking out to either side. Okay, so our antibonding for the CBR sigma star orbital um, has like this big thing sticking out the backside of the carbon. Um, okay, so when we're doing arrow pushing for this, um, what's the LUMO for this reaction? Like what am I dumping electrons into when I come into the system? Yep, CBR sigma star. Which, as a reminder, that's because I'm breaking the CBR bond by adding extra electrons to the system. So, um, if we actually show the shape of what this orbital looks like, you'll notice that it has this huge lobe sticking out the back of the carbon. And nucleophile is going to have to come at that lobe of the orbital to actually attack there. In other words, it's going to have to overlap whatever orbital it's using, usually like a lone pair, non-bonding thing, um, to actually get any kind of bond forming to the carbon. So with this lobe of the sigma star orbital, Okay, so this is why backside attack has to happen. It just turns out the way the orbitals are shaped, that's like the only place you can sort of get purchase on that carbon and then kick the bromine out the other side. So SN2 always, always, always goes by backside attack, always inverts the stereochemistry. Um, I don't think I actually wrote that on there, but... SN2 will always flip bold to dashed or dashed to bold. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, cool. Did I move the camera back? I did not. Nope. There we go, okay. So one last thing about SN2. And this actually ties a little bit into basicity versus nucleophilicity. Um, <clears throat> so I think I actually used these back in chapter three when we started looking at acid base versus nucleophilicity, um, where we have ethoxide attacking methyl and kicking out bromine to get ETO, CH3, and Br minus versus ETO minus attacking a proton, kicking out bromine. Okay, so the difference is, is a proton the one that's getting swapped from one molecule to another? In which case this is acid base. Or is a methyl group getting swapped from one molecule to another, in which case this is nucleophile electrophile. Specifically, now that we've looked at this reaction some more, we know this is an SN2 reaction. Okay. So arrow pushing for these looks exactly the same. Um, whether you're doing SN2 or acid base, but it turns out it's much, much easier to pick a proton off of something than it is to pick an alkyl group off of something. So acid base is just about instantaneous, while SN2 varies, but it usually takes minutes to hours or maybe days if you're unlucky with your setup. So, if 
you happen to have some, competi uh, some competition, um, some competing reaction around that the thing will actually prefer to do acid base on, um, then it's actually going to do that first, which might change your nucleophile that's involved. which might make a new nucleophile. Okay, so for example, we might think, okay, I want to do SN2 with this nucleophile. I want to do it on that substrate. Um, I know I can get away with protic solvent, so I'm just going to put this in ethanol. <coughs> all right. So um, you might not know the pKa values for all of these just yet, but you might be looking at this and saying, hold on. I know this is a decently strong base, carbon with a negative charge. I'm getting a suspicious feeling about this, so I'm going to go look this up in the pKa table, and I'm going to find that this has a pKa for its conjugate acid, of 25. Meanwhile, I know that ethanol has a pKa value of 16, which means that this is quite a bit stronger base than the conjugate of my solvent. OK, so what's actually going to happen first here is Long before this gets the idea of going after the carbon and trying to do SN2, um, this is actually just going to go rip a proton off your solvent instead. So instead of the nice SN2 thought, uh, setup you thought you were doing, all you're going to get out of it is this acetylene molecule and ETO minus and your alkyl halide still sitting around. But now you have a different nucleophile, and this might be something that's still OK with doing SN2 on your substrate. So you are going to end up with, instead of the alkyne group on there, you're going to end up with ETOCH3 plus Br minus plus this acetylene gas. OK, so long story short, so either use an aprotic solvent or one that won't get deprotonated by your base or one that, if it does get deprotonated, it gives you another copy of the base. So for example, if I used ETO minus plus this alkyl halide, I could easily use ethanol, because even if this base does deprotonate the solvent, I'm just getting another copy of the base out of it. So this is really common, an alkoxide like this in a solvent that's like the conjugate acid of it. So it could also be written as CH3Br in ETO-